Hi, everybody. If you're coming on, welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. And all right. Hey, everybody. This is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal. Uh, welcome to our very first um, winery close-up webinar of the year. Uh, it seems like such a long time, but uh, it was last middle of December that we were here and we're, we're back and uh, it hasn't really been that long, but it just seems like a lot has happened with the holidays in between. So on behalf of the Psalm Journal, Psalm Foundation, and the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia by National Geographic Publishing, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Our theme is a cross-section of Western Europe. Uh, the old country, the old world, across the pond, whatever you want to call it, uh, it is definitely the standard bearer for terroir and varietal typicity. A lot of the original icons uh, hail from there. And we're going to delve into a little bit of a cross section with some of Western Europe's iconic wines and winemakers. Uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded on Facebook Live. Uh, it is also being recorded and links will be available to the recording at somjournal.com and somfoundation.com. A printed recap of this webinar will appear in the April-May issue of Psalm Journal. If you have not already subscribed to the Psalm Journal, please send me a note, uh, either through the website or to Lars at psalmjournal.com and let us know. Um, it is a complimentary subscription to everybody that's in the trade. Uh, so uh, speaking of everybody that's in the trade, we have some wonderful incentives for you to pay attention to today. Uh, normally, we have Lynn Fletcher telling us what's going on with Psalm Foundation, but today we have Betsy Baker is, is here to tell us a little bit. Betsy, why don't you tell us a little bit about the wonderful incentives that the Psalm Foundation is putting out for our viewers today. Sure, uh, thank you, Lars, and thank you to all of our panelists for joining today. So we will do a random drawing for everyone who attended, and we will determine eight recipients of Psalm Geo uh, for one year. If you are one of those lucky recipients, you will be notified on Monday. There will also be an essay competition. The top two winners will receive a copy of the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. And then the first place winner will receive a check for $400. Uh, so you'll receive a prompt following today's uh, workshop uh, by Monday the 24th. Make sure you check your spam folder if it doesn't show up in your regular email. And then the essays will be due by Sunday, January 30th at 11 p.m. Pacific time. Winners will be announced by February 9th. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Betsy. 450 bucks for writing an essay. That's a pretty good rate. Um, so I also wanna, if you haven't had the chance to see Samjir, you're gonna get a little taste of it today. It's a fantastic program. I always like to call it where Google Earth meets the wine world. Uh, and we have with us today, the gentleman, the, the brains behind it, gentleman who developed it, Greg Van Wagner, longtime sommelier at Jimmy's. Uh, and he's created this wonderful, um, uh, program and he's going to share it with us a little bit today by giving us a little bit of a walk around uh, to tell us where we're going. So Greg, why don't you give us an overview of our romp through Western Europe today? Fantastic. Thank you, Lars, so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, we have the Psalm Geo Tour, which you'll see it's part of a larger platform that has in-depth wine theory for all the world's uh, notable wine regions tours that cover all the classics as well as the emerging regions and over a hundred high res uh, paper maps for uh, print and download. Um, but we're gonna be going all around Europe. Uh, we're gonna be starting off actually in Germany with Dr. Lozen. Um, we have Italy well represented. Um, here we have in the Veneto, the crew of Cartice. Um, we'll go more into that later. Medici Ermiti, down to representing Tuscany as well as Piedmont. Uh, Guinidu wines, and over to France, the wines of uh, Pic Pau de Pinier. Finally, we're going to head to Spain. Uh, Say solo, so really great, uh, really great cross section. Now, starting off in uh, Germany, really, really, this is the world's greatest place to grow Riesling, right? Uh, they have half of the world's Riesling. You have cool climate, high latitude. Here we see on the northeast corner of uh, France. And really, when you have this cool climate, high latitude, uh, requires these steep slopes to maximize ripeness. Um, also in the Mosul, right, you have the um, Eiffel Mountains and the Hunsruck Hills. That helps to shelter the region. And the Mosul River, which uh, helps to moderate the temperatures. 
Now here, here we go. Uh, the wines of Dr. Lozen. I've been to this winery. This area is an absolutely stunning, stunning area. A truly special place. Um, slate soils help to reflect heat back to the vines at night. You can see pretty obviously where vines are planted and where they aren't. Um, one thing I really love about Germany is kind of like in Burgundy, right? They figured out the best sites uh, four or 500 years ago, and those are still the best sites today. Um, here we are, incredible area. Um, if you have the chance to get out there, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, and I'm excited to uh, hear more. All right, awesome. Thank you, Greg, or should I say, Herr von, von Wagner? It seems appropriate today. Uh, and very, very pleased. And one of the beautiful things about Western Europe is its traditions. And we have uh, very uh, much respected tradition and innovation combined with Ernst Lossen, who is here to present his wines uh, about Dr. Lossen Winery from Middle Mosul in Germany. Ernst, welcome. I think you're on mute. Ernie, you're on mute. Ernie, if you can hear me, nobody else can hear you. You're on mute. Kirk, are you um, to... Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, sorry. Um, so the Mosul, uh, where we are, is basically the, uh, rated the most northern wine growing region here uh, in Germany or historically even in Europe. Um, it is basically the river Mosul. Uh, took 200 million years to dig the valley, you know, to dig the valley into what we call the slate hills of the Rhineland. Um, and that is basically the reason with, that we are able to grow wine. Because if you look here into the mountainsides, it's far too cold up there to, to, to ripen grapes. You barely get the potatoes ripe up there. Um, and um, but that is the valley, basically the steep slopes, uh, which gives us the chance to ripen the grapes. And that's the reason also that we have three, what we call three microclimates, which are very important to ripen the Riesling. And so you can roughly say uh, the vineyard we look at is, um, as more south facing the slopes are, as better because they get sunshine from morning to the evening, as steeper the slopes are, as more direct inclination of sunshine into the soil, as warmer the vineyard, as better it is, and as more close the vineyard uh, to the river, as better it is because it gets the moderating influence of the water to the vineyard. So roughly you can say as more south facing, as more steep and as more close to the river, as more grand cru the vineyards are. And that barely ends up in a classification. This is the classification we used to belong to the Prussian government um, um, between 1816 and 1918. And the Prussian government in the middle of the 19th century, 1846, made a classification for the Mosul and it is the three tier system as we know it from Burgundy. This classification is even older than the Burgundy classification. And the three tier system, all the dark brown spots you see on the map, these are basically the first growth vineyard site, what they call in Burgundy, Grand Cru. The medium brown spots are the second growth vineyard sites, what they call in Burgundy, Premier Cru. And the higher elevated and site ready pale brown spots are basically the third growth vineyard sites, the village. And you see all the dark brown spots are all south facing, you know. These are all the south facing spots, which are Grand Cru rated and, and the very steep spots, you know. Um, we introduced today uh, a very, 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 I um, mean, highly rated vineyard, a very famous Grand Cru for the Mosul. It's called the Sandai Vineyard, the Velener Sonnenuhr Vineyard. Velen is the village, the Sonnenuhr means sundial, and, and, um, and the sundial in the name of a vineyard, you can imagine, already gives you an indication that it is a 100% south facing vineyard, you know. And so it's a great vineyard because you see from eight to six o'clock, you have the whole sunshine during the whole day. So the full sunshine gives you ripeness because that is basically our problem if you're so north to get the grapes ripe. Um, the typical soil in our area, you see it already, the surrounding cliffs, you know, is the slate soil here in the Mosul. This is the slate soil of the Vilna Sonnenuhr. You can say, uh, we have only maximum one meter topsoil and from the topsoil 60 70 percent is only stones and then the pure cliff starts you know and this high content of these kind of slate stones gives a very good drainage to the soil and that is also one of the reasons that we are one of the 
I mean, very few regions or possibly one of the only region, at least in Germany, which never had been by, had by phylloxera, you know? This soil never gave us uh, phylloxera. We still have uncrafted wines, Front de Pied, um, which are more than 130 years old. The vineyard which we introduce here, where we harvested this wine, is from a 130 year old vineyard uh, on their own roots, planted by my great grand grandfather. And so we're still doing it. We don't replant. Uh, these wines can be getting very old if they're, that, um, if they're still on their own roots. So the wine which we have now in the class, or you have in the class, is the 19, 2015 Wehlener Sonnenuhr, Wehlen the village, Sonnenuhr, the vineyard, Sandal vineyard, a reserve, Alte Reben means uh, VA vineyard, old vines. Uh, in this case, we have still about 10 hectares uh, original rootstocks, which are all over 100 years old. And so here we call them VA vineyard, old vines. Um, this wine is called reserve because it is produced still in the um, in the style as my great grandfather made dry wines. And here we select only the oldest vineyards, you know, um, and this vineyard is called, we use the Le D on the, uh, on the label. And these very old vineyards, we all know as older the vineyard is, as more deficit flowering. So we have a lot of what the French call mille rondage, hen and chicks, you know, of grapes. And these hen and chicks, you know, uh, gives these little, little berries, you know, deficit flowering, no seeds in there. And this makes very, very complex wines. And what we do, we select all these, I mean, these kind of mill rondage fruit, uh, we select out um, in a separate bucket, in a, in, we, everybody of our pickers have three buckets, a black bucket and a red bucket, and these little white buckets. And all the grapes are selected. We are on a river. We always have botrytis. We select the botrytis out, medium botrytisized fruit, fully botrytisized fruit, which makes noble sweet wines. But these healthy grapes and these mirondage grapes, we select out and put it in this black bucket. And that makes our dry wines because we don't want to have any botrytis. We don't allow any botrytis in our dry wines. The winemaking is pretty simple. We, um, we ferment all our juice, all our dry wines in the traditional Fuda casks, which are 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 liters, the German oak, you know, the wine after fermentation, if it is dry, we sulfur it, top it up, and then we leave it, the reserve wines, two years, 24 months in the barrel on the full yeast, but no batonnage no steering, you know? They're sitting on the full yeast for two years, 24 months. Then we wreck it off the yeast, we bottle it, and then we give the wines another four years in the bottle before we release it. That's the reason you're tasting now the 2015. The 2015 was just released, two years in the barrel on the full yeast, no batonnage. That is the traditional winemaking as it, my grand grandfather did it between 1880 and 1928 when filters had been invented, you know? When the filters had been invented, they didn't have to wait la that long anymore. And so they could do this, you know? Yeah, that was um, um, the short introduction about our area. <laughs> this, by the way, is our winery. <laughs> Fantastic. Beautiful winery, thank you. And in perfect German timing too. Thank you very much, Ernie. So, um, you know, can you just talk to me very, very briefly about German oak? It's something I had not heard about before. Uh, obviously, I'm very fortunate enough to be able to be tasting this wine right now. There's no oak influence per se. Obviously, the oak is uh, helps well, wines well, oxygenate. I mean, German oak is the same like French oak is oak. An oak tree here in Europe is the same kind of type of oak, you know. Um, we have a lot of oak here. And I mean, I'm, I, I know that our forests are also selling a lot of oak to France. Um, but that's that's common. This is nothing. That is nothing uh, really uh, tricky, you know. Uh, but here, German oak was always used for for making barrels. But we have the tradition of big barrels, fuder barrels, you know. But you're right. Uh, we don't use new oak for our wines. You no, know? that means we we still buy a lot of new oak. I mean, big barrels. But in the first two three years, we don't use it for our concrete vineyards. You know, in the first year, we do only water in there. You know, to get most of the oak out. You know, in the second year, we do only the village in there. In the uh, in the in the third year, we do only primicu in there. And from the fourth year, we use it for the concrete because we don't like the oak. A taste with the Riesling, it doesn't work, you know? I mean, you know, yeah. oak is an acidity, Riesling is a high acidity yielding grape, and then oak, uh, the, the oak acidity and the, the Riesling acidity that don't match together. Right. I we like don't do say. malolactic fermentation, you know? Okay. Therefore, we keep the acidity with our wines. That is the backbone of Riesling. 
it's the beauty of Riesling as far as I'm concerned. But I agree, uh, oak should be an ingre- uh, a tool, not an ingredient. Yes. So uh, thank you very much, Ernie. That was a fascinating presentation, much thank appreciated. You. Greg, where is our next stop on this Euro tour? So we are headed over to the Veneto in Northeast Italy. Um, and really when you're looking at the Veneto um, for top wine regions, you're looking in the foothills of the Alps. Uh, this is really where all of the, uh, the highest quality regions of the Veneto are. Um, specifically today, we are headed to a very, very special zone for Prosecco, uh, Canelliano Varbiane. So as you can see, you know, Prosecco can be made across a, a, sec- a large section of the Veneto as well as freely. And these wines are specific to this one really special zone. Um, really completely different. And specifically, we're talking about the wines of Cartizze. Uh, so this is, you could call it the, the Grand Cru of the region, uh, 108 hectares, uh, really special hillside that's producing, you know, really the top uh, exploration of the Glare grape. And this shot that we see at the end, just really, really incredible. Um, I've never been there. I've always, always, always wanted to. Um, people that have been there have just said that it's unlike anything you ever see on the face of the planet. So I'm excited to hear more. Yeah, I can, I can tell you I've, I've had the pleasure actually of harvesting in Prosecco and it's uh, definitely heroic viticulture, not dissimilar to what's going on in Riesling. But to tell us more about it today, we have Federica Gaiotti. Uh, who is with the Research Center for Viticulture and Enology in Conegliano Valdobbiadine in Cartice. Uh, she's presenting a, a beautiful Valdobbiadine Superiore Cartice that the consortium has put together. It's not a, a brand per se, but speaking about this wonderful territory, which I think uh, Prosecco has obviously gotten a, uh, uh, a certain imagery and popularity, but there are some real gems out there that, that need to be appreciated, especially to us in the Sam world. So, Federica, buongiorno, and tell us, how do you communicate the, the peculiarities and uniqueness of the terroir of Cartice? Hello, buongiorno, everybody, and thanks for your introduction. Um, I share my screen. Great. So, um, as Greg uh, introduced uh, um, uh, the production area of the Conegliano Vado Priadene Prosecco Superiore, um, the OCG is the beautiful hilly area that you see in this uh, picture. And this area is uh, characterized by uh, a very complex orography. So to understand this terroir and its link with the Prosecco Superiore wines, we carried out a comprehensive zoning study of uh, all the denomination. And thanks to this study that it's described in this book um, on the terroirs of Conegliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco wines, We can now tell how difference in terms of soils, of microclimates, elevation or exposure, uh, give rise to different uh, organolectic expression of uh, our Prosecco wines. Um, Here you see a map of uh, the denomination and uh, here we have different Prosecco wines produced uh, in this area and they are represented uh, in the pyramid of quality. The basic uh, product is the Conegliano uh, Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore DOCG that is produced in all the 15 communes of uh, the denomination. Uh, then the Conegliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore Rive, and the Rive selection is produced only in vineyards on steep slopes uh, and in specific municipalities or villages. And at the top of the quality pyramid, uh, we have uh, the Valdobbiadene Superiore di Cartizze di OCG, that is the grand crew of the denomination, and it's uh, the wine selection that uh, you are tasting with us. Uh, the Cartizze is uh, a small area of just uh, 108 hectares, and it is uh, composed of a series of hills characterized by quite steep slopes and a perfect south exposition. 
And there are some characteristics that uh, make this area uh, and its Prosecco wines uh, unique and different from uh, the rest of the denomination. Um, first of all, the soil. The soil in the Cartizia is unique and different from all the other soils in this uh, denomination. And the soil of the Cartizia are based on ancient sedimentary rocks of marine origin. And in fact, it's quite common to find size uh, if you walk uh, and look at the soils uh, in this area. And this bedrock has been shaped over the time to form uh, soils with a clean loam texture and a very rich in limestone. And this high limestone content plays a, a very important role in the wine quality because it's often associated with the aromatic complexity, but also with the olfactory intensity of the wines of uh, this area. The climate in the Cartizia is also unique, and this is for two reasons. Uh, the first is the uh, south orientation of the seas uh, and also the steep slopes uh, that favor the perfect exposition of the vineyards to the sunlight. And this is very important for the uh, optimal ripening of the grapes. Uh, uh, but also in these hills, there is uh, a constant breeze that blows from the mountains uh, uh, at the back. Uh, and these mitigate the temperatures during the summer and help uh, maintaining good acidity in the grapes, but also uh, keep the canopy dry and prevent the diffusion of, uh, of the disease. Last but not least is the age of the vineyards because uh, most of the vineyards in the Cartizia are quite old with several examples of vines up to 80, 80 or 100 years old. And why is this associated with a greater quality? Because these old vines uh, uh, have reached uh, over the time a perfect balance with the cultivation side. They develop deep root system able to find uh, water and nutrients in the deep soils layers, but also stabilized uh, a favorable uh, relationship with the microorganisms and with the microflora and microfauna uh, in these soils. So these old vines can guarantee a good and steady quality over the years. So uh, in synthesis, the positive combination of climate, soil and vine age allow for the production of very uh, good quality grapes in this specific area. And it means high sugar content, uh, optimal acidity level, and also high amounts uh, of uh, aroma compounds. Uh, coming to the wine, uh, the classic uh, Valdo Viadene Superiore di Cartizze comes in the dry version. Uh, and it means uh, with a, a residual sugar between 17 and 32 um, grams per liter. And the official bottle of the consortium, that is the wine that you are tasting, uh, has a sugar content of 20, around 25 grams per liter. Uh, what's remarkable in this wine is, uh, I think you can perceive it, the perfect balance between the sugar and acids. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the palate, this wine is very soft and crisp. Uh, and as we say, the, um, there's a high content of aroma compounds that makes the sensory profile of this uh, wine very full and rich uh, with a lot of fruity notes uh, like pear, peach or apricot, but also uh, hints of uh, flowers. Uh, these characteristics make uh, the Cartizze wine really uh, unique and easily recognizable from the, the other Prosecco wines produced uh, in a uh, denomination. Um, uh, I think I finished and I wish uh -huh. you can have the chance to taste our wines and also welcome you to visit our terroirs uh, in Conegliano Vadoviadene. Thank you. Grazie Federica, that was beautiful. Um, I have to say when you started that last slide, I took a sip and then by the time you started talking about peach and apricot, that's what, exactly what I was getting on the finish. The wine's got some beautiful uh, elegant, elegance, elegance uh, on the attack and then just finishes with this beautiful round fruit flavor on the uh, on the finish. So compliment, very nice, beautiful wine. All right, Greg, I hope uh, you've got some of your sound issues worked out a little bit. Let's see uh, what is our next stop on the Euro tour. 
Absolutely. So we are. We just lost you, Greg. It looks like you're muted. Yes, we are headed to Emilia Romagna, the classic area for Lambrusco, um, but also known for some of the most famous foods in Italy. Um, between prosciutto di Parma, we have uh, balsamic vinegar of Modena, uh, and a number of different unique pastas. All of these regions here are specialists in the Lambrusco family of grapes. I believe there's about 15, and each of them has distinct characteristics. Here we have Medici Ermiti. Um, in my opinion, I've had these wines before. Um, I'm just my favorite producer of Lambrusco. They have 80 hectares, all form, farmed organically, uh, and focus solely on really, really high quality Lambrusco. Here we have a great shot of the winery and back to Lars for more. Excellent, thank you very much, Greg. So uh, uh, yeah, I was actually in um, uh, Parma uh, last year in September and had some wonderful Lambruscos to, to wash down all those nice rich foods, which is the real, to me, the real wonderful secret of, uh, of good Lambrusco. And Alessandro Medici from uh, the, the historic family of Medici Armette in Reggio Emilia is here to tell us uh, about his Lambrusco and using the example of his Concerto Organic Reggiano Lambrusco. Welcome, Alessandro. Ciao, Lars. Next time, come to visit us, first of I all. I will, I promise. So thank you for the introduction, Greg. Uh, I am Alessandro Medici. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I represent the fifth generation of the Medici family. Um, our winery is called Medici Armete. And uh, from 132 years, we produce uh, Lambrusco. Uh, our region, as Greg said, uh, is uh, called Emilia-Romagna, uh, that is uh, between the north and the center of Italy. It's one of the most uh, dynamic region. It, that's why it's called the Motor Valley. You know, brands like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati are from our area, and they're called also the Food Valley. As Greg said, uh, there are several food products uh, from here. Because uh, Emilia-Romagna is considered one of the most uh, fertile area in the whole world. Um, this is one of our estates. Um, in total, we have 80 hectares of vineyards uh, in five estates. And this is, uh, for us, the most important, uh, where we produce our most important uh, uh, Lambrusco. Uh, here you can see how is uh, um, usually uh, the agriculture and the viticulture in our land. You know, it happens uh, like the 95% on a flat land. Uh, but behind our, our estate, we have these soft uh, hills and these mountains that create this chain that is called Apennine. The Apennine chain divides perfectly Emilia-Romagna region from Toscan region. And this uh, chain of mountain is very important because it creates the perfect microclimate for the viticulture in Emilia-Romagna. Um, so here we have the production of, uh, of Lambrusco, that is our wine, but uh, uh, to make Lambrusco wine, uh, we have to produce Lambrusco grape because Lambrusco is the name of a grape. So it's exactly like to say, to say Riesling, to say Sangiovese, to say Nebbiolo, it's the name of a grape and it has uh, um, a particular characteristic because Lambrusco is a family of different varieties that uh, usually uh, composed the, the Lambrusco grape, the Lambrusco family. We have around 50, but uh, you know, growers today have developed mainly six different Lambrusco varieties. And here you can read uh, all the, the most important varieties of Lambrusco. All these characteristics, all these varieties have different names. They grow on different soils and they have different organoleptic characteristics. So a different residual of sugar, a different uh, tannin, but they have uh, a common characteristic that is acidity. Because the acidity of Lambrusco, the pH, especially for the fourth variety that you can read here, the Lambrusco di Sorbara, is one of the highest in Italy. Uh, we talk about in every single vintage about a pH that is between 2.5, 2.7. You know, it's very close to the, to the pH that producers have in the champagne area. So it's perfect to make sparkling wines. Because Lambrusco is a red and sometimes a rosé uh, with a shorter skin contact, sparkling wine uh, made with Lambrusco grape. And the real Lambrusco is uh, 
always dry, so with a low level of sugar. This is a very important point because I'm sure that you heard in the past about the sweet Lambrusco. The sweet Lambrusco was a, a commercial invention from the 80s uh, that you know has been one of the best seller wine in the world, but that wasn't the real Lambrusco. The real Lambrusco is dry with a very, very low level of sugar and with a high level of acidity. It's made by several varieties of Lambrusco grapes, as I said previously, and it's produced with three different methods of production. We have the Sharma method, that is basically the 95% of the production. So the second fermentation happens in the steel tank and it lasts between one and five, six months. We have the Champenoise method. So the second fermentation happens like for the Champagne or Francia Corta uh, in the bottle for several months or a year. Um, and at the end of the fermentation, we have the, the degorgement just to remove the yeast. And then we have the most historical method. So the original method of production of Lambrusco, this is the ancestral method or the Pednard method. So the second fermentation happens always in the bottle, but without the final degorgement. So we leave the yeast and we sell the wine with the yeast inside. Now we move to the final part of my presentation because I would love to explain it. Uh, our flagship wine. This is uh, our concerto, that in English means concert. It is an organic wine, and it is one of the pioneers of the good quality Lambrusco because um, it is the first single vineyard Lambrusco ever produced. Uh, it was 1993, uh, the first vintage of production. And believe me, uh, the image of Lambrusco at the time was very, very bad because all the world thought Lambrusco like a sweet wine. So my family wanted to change this reputation, making a great quality Lambrusco, starting from the land, starting from the vineyard. So we created the first single vineyard, the first crew, Lambrusco, uh, on a soil made uh, uh, mainly by clay, that is crucial to make Lambrusco. We decided to use um, the Lambrusco Salamino variety, 100%, because Salamino for us is the most balanced variety of Lambrusco between the fruit, between the tannin, and between, uh, between the acidity that here is very, very important. Uh, it is dark, it's really red because Lambrusco is red with bubbles and dry. Bubbles that we make uh, with the Sharma method for this wine, that is a quite long Sharma method that lasts between five and six months. And for this reason, we get these very gently and elegant bubbles. So we have uh, acidity, we have tannin, we have bubbles, so we are talking about uh, a very versatile, a very drinkable, a very refreshing wine. I actually don't have the time to tell you all the pairings that I would love to suggest. I will write on the chat later, uh, but this is a, a really versatile wine. Uh, as last time, I would love to conclude uh, uh, telling you that it's very hard to say that Lambrusco is uh, the most important variety that you can find in the world, but it's very easy to say for me that Lambrusco is one of the most gastronomic one of the most versatile and one of the most drinkable and refreshing wine that you can find in the world because you could pair with our cuisine from any international dishes. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Alessandro. So I, I have to say the, uh, the color is phenomenal and you can see the, uh, the, that beautiful skuma, that beautiful fizz. What would you say is the ideal type of glass to serve a, a good Lambrusco like this in? Yeah, we discussed about this before and uh, I answered you all glasses except flute because Lambrusco <laughs> is beautiful fruity aroma. So mm -hmm. we don't need to, to close. Also the temperature is really important, not too, not too cold. That's very important. Not at champagne temperature, for example, because it's a red wine, you know, it, it has bubbles. I know this is unique, um, but uh, in the same time it's red. So it, it, it has this beautiful aroma that we need to preserve in the tasting. Excellent. And in, in 10 seconds or less, name the top three international cuisines, wine pairings that you would have with this wine. Japanese ramen, very similar to a tortellini, uh, a beautiful oily Mexican taco, and uh, American barbecue or burgers that I personally love. It. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Alessandro. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Greg, what's our next stop here? So we are headed to Tuscany as well as Piedmont, uh, but our first stop is here in Tuscany. Uh, Guinigi wines, classic Mediterranean climate uh, that's really perfect for Sangiovese. 
Uh, these are the, the, the top regions that you can see, which are really all inland for San Giovese, um, Chianti Classico, Chianti, and Brunella di Montalcino. Uh, Bordeaux varieties drive more so coast. And then we're also going to be talking about uh, Piedmont, specifically lines of Barolo, um, Iolo, the king of grapes. This is definitely the area you want to be in for it. Um, some of the best known in the world definitely a classic region. Um, and with the winery, one thing I really love about this, um, you know, winery sustainability and the practices that you use there are becoming more and more of a conversation and a great reason. Uh, and I love to work on it. And here is the uh, namesake tower. And uh, back to Lars for more. All right. Thank you, Greg. So, um, Guinigi, you know, the name Sebastiani is a very well-known name in American viticulture, uh, but we don't always associate it with Italian other than Italian-American. And here with uh, the decidedly uh, least accented English of the day, we have August Sebastiani, a proprietor of Three Badge, or should I, can, is it okay, August, if I call you Augusto for, for this presentation? Quite all right. Guinigi Wines. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, really excited to be a part of this, uh, this conversation. Uh, unique, uh, obviously, in that I am a world away from uh, the source of the wines I'm here to talk about. Uh, but that's an important part of, of my story and, and our story here at Three Badge. So uh, long story long, uh, Three Badge Beverage is uh, a continuation of a long uh, family story uh, as it pertains to wine here in the Sonoma Valley. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Samuele, uh, moved in the late 1800s. Uh, and so that makes me fourth generation uh, here in Sonoma. Uh, my grandfather and namesake uh, took the reins uh, in the mid 1940s and actually really focused what was then a very uh, robust and diverse family entity uh, on the agricultural piece and really understanding what uh, Sonoma meant for New World Wines, helping with many other pioneers to put Sonoma and Napa on the map as it pertains to, uh, to grape growing and, and wine production. Uh, my dad and his brother, actually in the picture you see next to him, um, helped to kind of focus on, on the branded business. Um, and, uh, and here I stand, you know, proud to kind of carry that legacy in a pretty unique way. Uh, we've been out of the old family ranch now for, uh, for some time, but what Three Badge has provided us with is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about the family uh, component and our connection to, uh, to philanthropy uh, in, in here in our Sonoma uh, Valley. And uh, we bought a firehouse and the three badge story is a connection to uh, my grandfather's time as a volunteer firefighter here in this very firehouse. So as you can see behind me is a picture of the old uh, Sonoma Plaza. Um, and again, we're here happy to talk about, you know, who we are and what we're about. But today, uh, the topic of conversation is our, our wines uh, we, we call Ganiji. So we are, as many know, uh, a negociant uh, in wine and in spirits, both. We have a, a very robust spirits portfolio, a very unique wine portfolio. We uh, source wines in a number of ways and spirits in a number of ways uh, to get from uh, with wine, grape to bottle. Um, and so as purveyors, we are searching high and low uh, all over, obviously, Sonoma, the area of uh, Northern California and into actually Washington and Oregon as well. Uh, but sourcing wines from from Italy, which is which again is such a huge part of our family story. Growing up, knowing um, that you know we were very entrenched in uh, the local wine program, uh, we, we never had California wines uh, around the table. Uh, and as I was a young adult, getting to know uh, some of these wines we were drinking, specifically Barolo, which was uh, continues to be a very dear favorite of my old man's. Uh, he continues to drink wines to this day, and the story being that New World wines, that California wines specifically, uh, while lovely in their own right, um, don't quite have the same food pairing uh, offerings that Old World wines do. And it comes with, you know, a little bit more tannic structure, but sometimes, uh, you know, higher acidity um, that doesn't quite overpower the food, uh, but that, that, that complements it well. And so uh, that's where we focus on Ganiji, uh, a unique tower uh, that's actually situated in, in the old part of Luca. Uh, Luca is an important uh, town for, for my family. We spent a lot of time talking about my dad's side and its connection to the old world, but we're actually, my family's closer to my mom's side. My mom's parents uh, are immigrants themselves. They've since passed, God bless them. 
um, but actually met uh, here in San Francisco. And we're very, very close to their family um, and, and speak with them, uh, you know, fairly regularly. When we visit, Luca happens to be a little bit of a hub for all parts Northern Italy. We've got uh, Ligurian cousins, we've got Tuscany cousins, um, and we spend a lot of time, uh, obviously, with this Guneji Tower, a, uh, you know, dates all the way back to the 1300s, so iconic to our connection to the old world. It was, uh, you know, part of building the, uh, the brand story, right? A lot of people see that picture and they don't even realize what it is or where it is, but it's such an iconic photograph that it really, really stands out. So as mentioned, uh, we look at Barolo specifically, uh, that's you know, obviously grown in, in Northwest Italy, um, at the foot of the Alps, uh, providing very favorable climate. That climate um, seasonally can, can sway considerably, uh, especially during harvest, which um, uh, the temperature swings provide a very robust uh, grape in, in very uh, limestone clay soils. Uh, and what you end up with is, is a grape in a Nebbiolo that can be quite fickle. If you actually go back 30 years, uh, we, we looked at actually growing Nebbiolo here in Sonoma. It didn't quite fare uh, so well. It was a little bit of an experiment knowing full well that it was doomed to fail, but hey, why not? Let's give it a shot. So, um, you know, Barolo is uh, actually a late, uh, I should say Nebbiolo actually typically is a late harvest uh, wine. In fact, historically, uh, for many, it actually used to be uh, uh, a sweet wine. Uh, it was harvested as late as it was. Uh, as we look at our 2016 DOCG, uh, Barolo 100% uh, Nebbiolo, we are, we are really proud of it. Um, I, as specifically with a food pairing, uh, would probably put it with Osobuco is kind of the first thing, uh, you know, braised veal uh, was, is really just, you know, takes me back to, uh, to when I was first learning about wine. Uh, this is a wine we're really proud to state is a 94 point rating from our friends at the tasting panel. Uh, and so as we roll uh, our reds out to um, really add some cachet to this brand Ganigi, in addition to a Prosecco, in addition to a Pinot Grigio, uh, we've got a full flight of reds coming online here shortly uh, that we're really, really proud uh, to talk about. Next, uh, we have our Brunello di Montalcino. As mentioned, the Toscani is, is again, so important to kind of who we are as a family. Um, and, uh, and it's another wine that, that, that is, you know, a little bit higher elevation, right? It's at the foothills uh, of the Alps, um, one of the driest climates in Tuscany. Um, and as you look at specifically the 2015 season, as we are now releasing, uh, it was, uh, kind of hailed as a well-balanced vintage. Now, both of these wines with a 2016 Brunello and a 20, I'm sorry, a 2016 Barolo and a 2015 Barolo, Brunello. Uh, are, are showing quite well, but still quite young. I mean, these are, you know, again, California wines we drink in 15 minutes, right? But you look at some of these old world wines, uh, you got to lay them down, give them, you know, eight, 10, maybe 15 years before they really, really start to open up. Uh, this guy here, the Brunello, uh, specifically, I would probably pair with, uh, you know, some gamey meats, maybe like a, um, uh, like a wild boar, right? Maybe something along those lines. Uh, might be kind of fun too. Um, the other piece that I will proudly state on our Brunello is a 93 point rating here from, from our friends at the tasting panel. So we're really proud to, uh, to show off both these wines. We're really proud to, to launch this brand. Uh, or the brand had been launched, but to, to launch an additional lineup of, uh, of pretty unique reds here within the brand. And, uh, and thank you very much for having me and really excited to be a part of the panel. Thank you, August Augusto. Um, <laughs> the wines are really beautiful. They, they both show such, they're super clean. They show great typicity. Uh, they're beautiful wines. And, you know, here in New York, we're going on one o'clock. So you got me, guy. you guys got me anxious for lunch. <laughs> 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 very nice. Compliments on the Guineji wines. Thank you very much. All right, Greg, what's our next stop? Perfect. Uh, we'll be headed to France, August. Oh, there we go. So we are headed to France, uh, specifically southern France, um, into the Languedoc, where we have Mediterranean climate, warm sunny days, uh, about more than 300 sunny days a year. Cool nights really help with the, uh, with the acidity and freshness. Um, now, two distinct regions here. We're talking uh, Roussillon, bordering Spain, uh, and then also the Languedoc. Uh, here we have some of the classic regions, Corbiere. We're talking about Picou de Pignet. 
um, right there by the Little Lagoon. Uh, if you ever if you ever take the TGV, you go uh, right on that little strip of land right next to it. It's a uh, really really incredible countryside. And so we're talking the peak pool grape. Uh, they call this the Muscadet of the South. Classic with oysters and fresh seafood and uh, infinitely drinkable. Really love these wines. And back to Lars for more. All right. Thank you, Greg. That uh, Those days of sunshine sound really good while I'm sitting here in a New York winter. Uh, so with us to bring us uh, to the evening in France, we have Mathias Michelin, who is the export manager at Les Costières de Pomerol and Le Co La Confrerie de Domaine. So um, he's been uh, 10 years in international experience, has his MBA, his WSCT, all those impressive things. But most important to me is that he is the son of a winemaker in Languedoc. So, uh, Mathias, bonsoir, welcome, and tell us a little bit about what makes Picpoul so unique. Hello. Yes, thank you for having me here. All right, I'll start sharing my screen and tell you all about Picpoul. Okay. So we're going to start with a, a short video because I thought it was uh, interesting to see um, a bit more about the landscape. Uh, so I'll be presenting you Les Costières de Pomerol. We are actually a wine cooperative uh, in the south of France, as um, Greg mentioned. I'll be presenting our flagship wine uh, from a unique appellation and a unique grape variety that is Picpoul de Pinay that you've seen just now on the screen. Uh, Picpoul being the grape variety and Pinay being the city, the, the little town actually, the little village where it's from. Mathias, sorry to the... interrupt, but we're not seeing your presentation. Oh, you're not? No. Oh, sorry. I just forgot to click on oh, the... <laughs> now you can see, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Just bring us to full screen. Great. Yeah. I just forgot to click on that. Yes, so sorry to um, start again. So, Le uh, Cossier de Pomerol, wine in the south of France, uh, presenting uh, flagship wine, Picpoul de Pinay, uh, that you've just seen on the screen, Picpoul being the grape variety, and Pinay being the little town, little village we're from. Um, we are located uh, right by the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you'll see just now, here the Tau Lagoon, so it's a large body of salt water uh, right in front of the Mediterranean Sea. You have the oyster beds, so um, that's also known as the perfect pairing with Picpoul, being a very crisp and refreshing wine. Um, you see the uh, forest and the plants very Mediterranean. We've got a hot and dry Mediterranean climate. Uh, with two types of vineyards that we'll see in more details afterwards. Uh, one that is fresher and the other one that's more inland with hills and that's drier. So that's a pickpool grape again. Um, so that's, yeah, the vines overlooking the um, Toll Lagoon. So as I mentioned, we're a wine cooperative. So unlike uh, the other presenters, uh, we're not a small family-owned producers. Uh, there are about uh, 350 vine growers. So a wine co-op is um, vine growers putting their resources together to have their own facility to make their wines. Uh, so we are a historical uh, co-op in the region starting 1932. We have uh, over 2,000 hectares. Uh, we produce a large amount of bottles, which is unusual for a wine co-op because most cooperatives sell in bulk to négociants. Uh, we do a very large portion, uh, we produce um, a large portion in bottles and 82% of whites and rosé, which is very unusual for the region. Languedoc is a lot more known for their red wines because uh, the climate is more inclined to it, but we'll see why uh, we have this particularity. And just to mention half the vineyards is now uh, certified sustainable. We have a number of growers that are converting to organic. We just started our first organic wines this year, and that's the um, that's where we want to go in the future. So that's a little overview of uh, the facilities. Um, so we are right uh, here between the town of Bézier and Set, um, in front of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, very warm summers, mild uh, winters, uh, extremely dry, a lot of sunshine. 
there are two, so it's clay and limestone, limestone um, the vast majority of our uh, soils, uh, but there are two areas um, in our vineyards. The one that is uh, next to the lagoon and that has a big influence with the sea breeze coming in, the morning fogs that really uh, keeps the grapes uh, fresh. And uh, it's also flat land. Uh, so this is where we'll have the higher acidity and uh, the most refreshing type of wines coming from the vines. And the one that's a bit more inland, that's more hillsides and um, has got more southern exposures where we'll find uh, more concentration um, in, the, in the grapes. And that's more for the reds and also the bit heavier uh, whites. And we do two main appellations. So the Picpoul AOP and the IGP Côte de Taux. It's a small appellation in, um, within that area because it's very distinctive to, uh, you go 20, or, uh, 20 kilometers up north and you've got completely different wines because you don't have the total microclimate. Uh, so that's a little picture of the inland uh, vines. Um, so four things that I thought were uh, a bit unique and different. Um, so the Roman her uh, heritage, uh, this is on the picture on the right. This is the Via Domitia. So that's um, um, a, a road that was uh, built by the Romans since the second century. And there are archaeological uh, digs that shows that they were amphoras and they were making wines in this area since then. The pig pool varietals, which I haven't spelled um, um, wrong. It's uh, the, the variety is spelled that way. The, uh, the appellation is spelled differently. Uh, so it's very Outside of Peak Pool Appalachian, which is small because it's only 1,600 hectares, outside of this Appalachian, there is only about 100 hectares spread out across the world. So it's very, very unusual. You don't find anywhere else. And uh, there are tracings of that grape variety uh, that was named Picapol uh, in the um, 14th century. So it's very indigenous from that region. Uh, then there is the Toll Lagoon, which makes the big difference, as I mentioned, the microclimate that brings uh, the sea breeze and the, and the fresh air. And, uh, and as well, so we have 82% of whites and rosé and the uh, calf co-op um, because we have a long history. Uh, the vine growers that are in the co-ops are from generations to generations. And having grown uh, to that size has really enabled us to have top-notch equipment uh, for the production of uh, white wines and rosé. So just a few words about the peak pool uh, HB. That's the one that's imported in the, in the US. Um, so crisp, refreshing, racids of wine, uh, crystal clear color, citrus fruits, flower blossoms, apricots. And uh, that's, as Greg mentioned, it's all sometimes compared to the Muscadet of the South, you know, an unusual grape variety. And, um, and also next to the sea, oyster friendly. So, so yeah. That was the presentation. Fantastic. Merci. So oh, yeah. um, one, one, I'm so much enjoying the wine. You know, Greg mentioned before, uh, Roussan and Marseillan. Uh, and this, this wine is just so much bright and crisp and delicious. And I can so much see it with oysters. Uh, really refreshing wine. We're having it now after I'm tasting it now. Again, I'm very fortunate that I get to taste through these wines. I'm having it after these big boys of Barolo and Brunello, and the wine just stands right up. Uh, yeah. To it. Beautiful, bright acidity. And it's very difficult if you do that on a blind tasting, like guessing yeah. the yeah. the the area where it's from, because there is no white wines uh, in the south of France, uh, in, yeah, in the Mediterranean climate that would stand out that way. Absolutely. Uh, and if a quick word again, 15 seconds or less about your choice of the closure of the twist off. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, the twist off. So that's mostly for export markets in France. To, to us, we prefer the screw cap because um, the screw cap, uh, the cork will allow uh, micro oxygenation, uh, which we clearly don't want uh, in this wine. And, uh, and the screw cap uh, for us is the best closure to retain that freshness. And, you know, it's not a wine that's meant to be aged. Uh, you should drink it within the first two years. So we really thought this was the, the best uh, thing to go with. Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you. So Gregory, or shall I say, since we're in France, that Gregoire, where is our, uh, our last stop on this tour? 
Yes, yeah, so we are headed to Spain. Um, I actually just got back from a couple months in Spain and the, the average quality of wine there has never been higher. It's uh, really, really incredible. They're doing great work. Um, here we have Castilla y Leon. Um, specifically, what makes Spain interesting too is you have a wide range of indigenous varieties, uh, but it's also the second highest average elevation country in all of Europe uh, after Switzerland. Uh, so these, this elevation helps to temper uh, some of the lower latitude. And you can just see, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, um, most of this area, you know, we're at over a thousand meters. Um, so really, really important to the wines and what makes them classic. Here we are, Ribera de Duero, really uh, one of the best areas in the world to grow Tempranillo. Um, old vines are extraordinarily important. Uh, there we have the town of Laura, uh, great area, great terroir. Uh, here we have some old vines. And these are really what uh, makes a lot of Roberto Duero so special. Uh, very concentrated, tiny berries that are, are smaller, uh, you know, smaller than your thumbnail, uh, but very, very intense fruit. And back to Lars for more. All right. Thank you. Now I'll say gracias, Gregorio, uh, now that we're in Spain and um, here to talk to us about uh, his Se Solo, Ribera del Duero, is um, Javier Zaccagnini, un, uh, un hombre español con un nombre italiano. Welcome, Javier. Hi, How are you doing? Well, Sorry. thank thanks for having invited me, invited me to talk about the terroir of Ribera del Duero. <clears throat> um, I think that, in, in, well, I'll start the time, so I know my Great. seven minutes are up. I'd like to convince you in these seven minutes that we have a unique region in Europe. Unique, of course, doesn't mean the best at all, but very, very different. And why is that? Well, to understand that, we have to start by understanding how it was formed. And the River del Duero, what is now Rivera del Duero, and other regions along the river, but basically started with a lake about 30 million, million years ago that was filled in slowly by a number of rivers. There was life in that lake, but the climate change about five million years ago, dried it completely, bringing all these shells to the bottom along with all the materials the river had been bringing along. Let's see if I can show you something. Um, Great. Let me see. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to... We can see it. Can you? Yep. I can't. Can you see? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but oh, well, I don't. In fact, let me see. Okay, uh, I can bring. Yeah, but it's you... not that what I wanted. What I wanted is this. Okay. Let me see if it starts moving in a moment. I hope. Yeah, it does. Great. Do you see my mouse? Do you see the little hand? Yes. Okay. You see, this is a flat top. This another flat top here. The lake was here, all that. It, and in a certain moment after being filled, dried and refilled again, it broke because of seismic and, oh, it stopped. And it, um, all the water went over slowly all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And, um, and it made, possible many regions, Ribera del Duero, the first of all, then it goes over to Rueda, Cigales, Toro, Arribes, all of them in Spain, crosses the Portugal border over to Vino Verde and Alto Douro, ends up in port. The lake went all the way there, carving the, the earth. And now I cannot, I cannot see the rest of the presentation. Can you? Okay, yeah. Uh, yep, there you go. Now if you go okay. forward. So this is, right. sorry. This is Spain. We are here, number 14. That's the region. See, all that was a lake. It broke here. This is the river, the, the actual, the present river Duero that continues, as I said, all the way. Okay. The, the, the lake was broke, but it was continued to be filled in as it was emptying. So it took a number of thousands and thousands of years to carve the valley as it is now. We ended up with a tremendous, tremendous variation of soils. See here's sandy, 
there you have stones and we can show you clay chalk sulfate carbonate um, 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 and um, lime everything we have a tremendous mixture of soils even within one plot it is like burgundy when burgundian analogies come to visit us and i take them around in the car they see that every 200 meters we're changing soils and they say mais comme chez nous absolutely but of course we're not as famous and uh, my admiration for the many hundreds of years of burgundy of making great wines but we have the same tremendous variation of soils um, due to this uh, explanation i give to you now but the most important thing to understand the terroir of our region is both things. One, this one you have here, the Tempranillo, which I'll come to a little later, and the climate. We have this region, um, let me see, we go back to the map, it's about 80 kilometers long here, east to west, and 30 to 40 north to south. And um, <clears throat> We, are, we start at 700 meters of altitude and go up to more than a thousand. This keeps, makes us um, have very, very cold nights during the raping period and not too warm days. We go from 35 degrees Celsius to 10 at night. So it's 20, even 25 degrees difference from day to night. That you see the small berries. We have a Tempranillo with a smaller berry than elsewhere in Spain and with a thicker skin, which allows for more uh, concentration of color and polyphenols and, and tannins in the grape. The climate is very special. As I said, we have very dry and cold winters. Then we have a short but very rainy spring and then a summer that is hot, but not too hot, and a long autumn that decides the quality of the grapes because we may have frost in autumn. We have frost in April, for sure. There may be frost in end of September. So the Tempranillo, which means early ripener, has to ripen, ripen very quickly. It's a short ripening period, and it's perfectly adapted to the region. Uh, do you know the Tempranillo, surprisingly, doesn't seem to thrive elsewhere than in Spain, and has been planted in Texas, in California, New Zealand, in Hawke's Bay, Australia. Even a friend of mine, who's a very good producer of Madiron, has asked us to plant our grapes in in Madiron. It doesn't it doesn't hurt. It doesn't work. Tempranillo seems to be exclusively to to Spain. So this altitude, the Tempranillo, which is very unique in Ribera del Duero, and this tremendous change of temperatures between day and night is what makes us have this beauty. We have about 70, uh, sorry, 24,000 uh, hectares of which 10,000 are 10%, 3,000 are very old vines from 60 to 100 years old. As you can see, this is a type of, of old vines in the So I think that's, that's it. My seven minutes are over. Thank you very much. Bravo. Gracias, Javier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was fascinating. I'm going to ask you to take your screen share down. So if you can just take your screen share. Great. All right. So thank you, Javier, again. Gracias. Dankeschön. Grazie. Merci to each of our brilliant panelists for this wonderful educational opportunity. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, this is, I think, the recurring theme here has been about some very unique grapes and terroir, uh, tradition, uh, tradition in terms of old, uh, long time standing techniques, as well as I think a few areas that have not seen uh, phylloxera, which is pretty fascinating to see as well. I'm talking about old vines here has been a constant theme, but yet, of course, a lot of innovation in Europe as well. So um, remember to get your essays in. Um, Betsy, you want to give us a little bit of reminder and thank again to the Sound Foundation, but you want to give us a little reminder of what's at stake and what the deadlines are? Sure. And, and thank you, Lars and Sound Journal for putting this on. Um, I'm with you. I'm, I'm on the Eastern uh, time zone as well, and I'm starving now talking about all these food pairings. So thank you for doing this. 
Um, so just a reminder, Monday will be the essay prompt going out, Monday the 24th, as well as our eight lucky winners of SOMGEO. Um, you will also be noti um, notified. Check your spam folders if you don't get it on Monday, and it will be due on Sunday, January 30th by 11 p.m., and winners will be announced February 9th. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's close to lunchtime, and I think I'm going to have some of this beautifully balanced Ribera del Duero with me. Uh, fa a very fast question for you, Javier. I'm sorry to go backwards, but um, oak treatment, because I know a lot of times with uh, with with beautiful wines of Spain, I always notice a little influence of American oak, and this wine is perfectly balanced. What is your oak treatment on this, Ribera? Well, in Ribera del Duero, traditionally, there was used American oak. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about 20 years ago, but for the last, let's say, more than 10, even 15 years, um, French oak is, is mainly dominating. Uh, I'm talking in general about most producers. <clears throat> Somehow we've moved completely to, <clears throat> excuse me, to French oak, and um, maybe with manolactic performed in American oak, um, and then racked to French oak for the, for the period of aging. We at Say Solo use 600 little barrels. We don't use a small, normal 228 PS Bourguignon. We use the Demi Mui, 600 little barrels, and they're all French oak. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Sorry for that diversion, but I just had to, uh, to get that point in because, again, another recurring theme with all of these wines is balance and elegance. They've all been uh, beautiful. Lars, by the way, you, you asked many others about the glass to use. Yeah. For Rivera del Duero Tempranillo, do not use a Tempranillo Riddle glass. All right. It doesn't Excellent. work. What would Somehow, you use? I don't know. Then I have to, I have to talk to Mr. Riddle and redefine that glass. It goes very well in many other glasses. Um, with no glass? Maybe all or Syrah, but certainly doesn't work with Tempranillo glass, I'm afraid. All right. Well, that's a very good point, Javier. Thank you for sharing As that. my personal opinion. Yes. I don't know if everybody agrees. <laughs> Okay, it's all good. It's all personal. All right. So just a reminder that this is being recorded on Facebook Live, uh, has been recorded, and you'll be able to find the recordings as well on somjournal.com and somfoundation.com. The printed recap will be in the April-May issue. Uh, and thank you uh, again on behalf of the Som Journal, Som Foundation for tuning in and join us again on February 17th when we talk about, we have a wonderful panel lined up for rising stars of the wine world. Uh, another exciting um, uh, webinar for you, another educational experience. And this has been great with these, definitely a group of, uh, of rock stars from Europe. So thank you all very much, panelists and audience for tuning in. Good evening, good day, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.